Welcome to the Biology 341 Evolution and Population Genetics lecture on transmission genetics and the hardy weinberg equilibrium. In the first part of this lecture, I'm going to review concepts that you should have learned in 210 and 211, but which will be important for our uh, further learning here. And then we will uh, also review the hardy weinberg equilibrium, go through some problems with it so that you can understand it, and so that, so that we can continue with lectures in which we talk about departures from the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So just to review a few important concepts, a gene is a region of a genome sequence that is a unit of inheritance, the product of which contributes to phenotype. Most often, the product of a gene is some sort of protein, which then directly contributes to, protein, to, to phenotype, but that is not always the case. A locus is a location in a genome. Um, this is a more general term for gene. This is just any particular section of uh, A's, T's, C's, and G's in a genome. It doesn't have to, con it doesn't have to form a, a gene. It's just an arbitrarily defined set of uh, bases. Uh, so it's a much broader meaning than gene. The plural of locus is loci. Always good to keep in mind. An allele is a variant form of a gene. So there are different versions of genes that float around in the population, and that is sort of the essence of population genetics. As diploid organisms, each of us has two alleles at each one of our genes or at each one of our loci. A genotype is the combination of alleles at a particular locus or at a set of loci. So I, would, I might have two alleles, one for my mother and one for my father, at a locus. That would be my genotype. I could also talk about all the loci that are involved in my eye color and the genotype that is involved in that. Phenotype is the expression of my genotype. So it's the result of transcription and translation resulting in a genotype and the in, in, the, in, the, in my phenotype, for example, my eye color, my hair color, my finger length, etc. And humans, of course, are eukaryotic species. Most eukaryotic species are diploid, although there are many that are also polyploid, um, having uh, more than two copies of each chromosome. Um, therefore, as diploid organisms, we also have two alleles per locus. Um, remember, though, just because we have each of us has two alleles at a locus, there could be many more alleles floating around in a population that we don't have. This is a picture of the basic chemical structure of DNA. So you see that there's a sugar phosphate backbone that the bases are built off of. Each base is is connected to its complementary base by hydrogen bonds, and hydrogen bonds are what stabilizes this double helix structure. Uh, C's and G's are connected by three hydrogen bonds. A's and T's are connected by two hydrogen bonds. And you'll probably recall the central dogma of, of molecular biology, which is that information flows from DNA through transcription into mRNA and then through processing and splicing into true mRNA, and then from through translation into protein. And here's a more detailed picture of the same concept. Recall that, there are, that eukaryotes have very complex machinery that regulates how often genes are transcribed and translated. So there are enhancers and silencers, promoters, that control how often a gene gets transcribed. Um, there is post-transcription modification where introns are excised and um, to create a single protein coding region. That region is then translated into a, a protein. Transcription moves in a five prime to three prime direction. So RNA polymerase will move along um, from 5' prime to 3', prime, adding bases onto the 3' prime end of the chain.
translation occurs from five prime to three prime in the opposite direction. And a, a strand will move through a ribosome and tRNA molecules will come in carrying a particular, their particular anticodon that is associated with a particular amino acid. As they come in, they find each, uh, their particular anticodon and are matched up with it and their, their amino acid is, is added to a growing polypeptide chain that then becomes the, the product protein. And those tRNAs are defined by 64 different possibilities, which are our genetic code. So each one of these represents a tRNA, which carries a, an associated amino acid. And this is exactly how information is transmitted from, D, from DNA into protein and from genotype into phenotype. And this is just another picture of the same genetic code where you would start here if you wanted to define a particular anticodon, A, then C, then A would give us a threonine. Most importantly for this lecture, recall Mendel's observations about independent segregation. So if we have a dominant trait and a recessive trait, for example here yellow being a, a dominant trait and green being a recessive trait, and we have a pure breeding yellow line, so big Y, big Y, and we'll call this genotype little y, little y. When we make those two genotypes together, we get big Y, little y, and big Y, little y, two hetero, or uh, any number of heterozygotes. When we make heterozygotes together in the F1 generation, we get one big Y, big Y, two big Y, little y, and one little y, little y. And we end up with a three to one ratio of phenotypes, or a one to two to one ratio of genotypes. I would encourage you to stop now and pause it and do a, a, a Punnett square to, sh to prove this to yourself. Here is that Punnett square of the F1 cross, where you have big Y, big Y, little y, little y, uh, on uh, two heterozygotes uh, crossing, and you have you end up with a three to one phenotypic ratio or a one to two to one genotypic ratio. This is looking at it in a hereditary tree. So we have the pure breeding strain. We cross to the F1 generation, creating all heterozygotes, and then the F2 generation where we get a we get three yellows and one green, or one big Y, big Y, two heterozygotes, and one little g, little g. And this brings us to the Hardy-Weinberg principle. The Hardy-Weinberg principle is just basically a logical extension of the Punnett square from an uh, individual cross between two organisms into the logical extension into, a, into interbreeding within an entire population. And it came about because uh, uh, Reginald Punnett had developed these had developed this and uh, these squares that that expressed Mendel's laws of segregation. However, as people became aware of the presence of of dominant traits, in particular uh, this trait called brachydactyly. Brachydactyly is a is a trait where that leads to um, very mal-shaped mal hands, and it happens to be dominant. So if somebody carries an allele for brachydactyly, they will express it. Udney Yule was a geneticist who questioned whether, whether brachydactyly was truly a Mendelian trait. And he reasoned that because brachydactyly is, is dominant, you should see in, our, in the human population, you should see a three to one ratio of, brach of brachydactylous individuals to sort of normal individuals. Reginald Punnett wasn't sure how to counter this argument based just on his Punnett square, and so he turned to the mathematician, Godfrey Hardy, who came up with the solution. And of course, as lots of things go in science, 
Um, at the same time, a German mathematician, Wilhelm Weidenberg, came up with the same solution, and so it was named for both of them. So when we're thinking on the individual level, we're thinking about a cross between two um, heterozygous individuals leading to this 1 to 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 ratio if we're talking about dominant traits. But we, when we think about populations, we need to think about all the individuals in the population mating at the same time. So that brings in the concept of a gene pool. We need to bring in, we need to think of all the individuals in a population, say all of the students in Biology 341 or all of the ground squirrels on the CSUMD campus. If we think of them as a collection of eggs and sperm where every egg and every sperm carries a single allele for a particular trait, that is the gene pool for this population. And if we assume random mating, these alleles will come together into, into completely random genotypes. So the question is, how can we draw a Punnett square for more than two individuals that are mating? Pause the lecture now to think about this and try to draw a Punnett square that involves more than two individuals. So as transmission geneticists, we want to think about a, sing a simple cross between a male and a female. So we would put the female across the top here, heterozygote, she has big A and little a gametes, and we put the male and we do a simple cross and we see the standard pattern of one to two to one um, in terms of genotype. As population geneticists, we want to think in terms of large populations, and so we just set up a super large Punnett square. Let's say there are 10 female gametes in the population. gametes in the population then we can calculate the frequency of big A frequency of big A the probability of seeing big A if you were to randomly draw it from the population is equal to P and that is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 big A's out of 20 total gametes. So 10 out of 20, or 0 0.5. Frequency of little a is equal to Q, which is equal also has 10 out of 20, and is also equal to 0 0.5. Now I can make these crosses, so all these big A, big A's going all the way like that, and like that, all of that would be big A, big A, big A, little a, Big A, little a, and little a, little a. And just from simple geometry, we can see that the total number of genotypes that have big A, big A is going to be equal to, so the frequency of big A, big A is going to be equal to P squared. The frequency of big A, little a here is going to be equal to PQ. 
the frequency of big A little a here is also going to be equal to PQ, and the frequency of little a little a here is going to be equal to Q squared. And from that, we get our basic Hardy-Weinberg relationship. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1, because all of this sums to 100% of the population. And that's the basic idea of Hardy-Weinberg. So we have 36 big A, big A, 24 big A, little a, 26 big, little a, big A, 16 little a, little a, and that all comes out to equal 100% of the population. And again, if we think about the probability of A as a proportion of the population being P, and the probability of little a as a proportion being Q, then we can say that P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1. And in this case, the, these, these are the genotypes. P squared is the, is the proportion of individuals with big A, big A. 2PQ is the proportion of individuals with big A, little a. And Q squared is the proportion of individuals with little a, little a. And if we just think about the allele frequencies, P plus Q it will always also always equal one. It will be all of the gene, all of the alleles in the population. And here's just another restating of the same idea. Q, Q squared plus P squared plus two PQ. So if P and Q represent the relative frequencies of the only two possible alleles in a population, then for a diploid organism, it's basically just a binomial expansion. So for a diploid organism, there's two copies, so p plus q squared. We do the binomial expansion, and we get p squared plus 2pq plus q squared. So that's the mathematical derivation of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So according to the Hardy-Weinberg principle, frequencies of alleles in a population remain constant from generation to generation. Um, the genotype frequencies you, you see in a population should be predictable from those allele frequencies. And the Hardy-Weinberg principle is a null hypothesis for evolution. If things are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, if allele and genotypic frequencies are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it means that evol evolution is not occurring. If a population is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we can, we can conclude that it is evolving for some reason. And the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, in order for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to occur, we would need to see no natural selection, an infinite population size, so no genetic drift. We'll talk more about what that means when we get to the lecture on genetic drift. No mutation, no gene flow, random mating. So if allele frequencies change over time, there must be a violation of one of these assumptions and therefore something interesting, some sort of evolution is occurring. And this, we can take these assumptions and translate them into the basic forces of evolution. And those forces would be mutation, natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow, which can be sort of described as a, as a combination of population subdivision and other sources of non-random mating. And each of these forces will be the subject of a lecture in the future. And we can think about other versions of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium just briefly. We'll mainly stick in this class to the, the basic two allele random mating um, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But if we had a triploid population, it would just be P plus Q to the third. And we would do the, the binomial expansion of that, and we would end up with this equation that would give us a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for a triploid organism um, with all of these potential offspring in a triploid or organism. What about for a tetraploid? I'll leave that to you to work out.
And we can also be more general in terms of how many alleles are segregating in a population. If there are three alleles, it's P plus Q plus R squared, and we do the expansion of that. For, N, for any number of alleles, it's just an expansion given the number of alleles in the population. And it's also important to remember that every locus, given recombination, every locus is following the Hardy-Weinberg principle independently. So the alleles at each locus can be under Hardy-Weinberg or not under Hardy-Weinberg, and it doesn't affect whether neighboring uh, genes are under Hardy-Weinberg or not. That's assuming complete recombination. We have a co-dominant locus with big R, big R, expressing uh, pink flowers or purple flowers. Big R, little r expressing pink flowers and little r, little r expressing white flowers. These are the genotype frequencies in the population and we can get the allele frequencies from that, which I'll show you in a little bit. What are the genotype frequencies in the next generation? Well, we would expect under Hardy-Weinberg so we know these are the genotype frequencies, and we've been able to get the allele frequencies as well. So P is equal to the frequency of R, and Q is equal to the frequency of little r. And now we want to get the genotype frequencies in the next generation. If we assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then we can simply get p squared, which is equal to the frequency of big R, big R, which is equal to 0 0.49, 2pq, which is equal to frequency of little big R, little r, equal to 0 0.7 times 0 0.3 times 2 equal to 0 0.42 and q squared which is equal to the frequency of little r little r or equal to 0 0.3 squared is equal to 0 0.09 And here's another version of the answer that shows it in Punnett square form. So remember, this is a giant Punnett square. So we have 70% of the population with big R, 30% of the population with little r, uh, and the same on this axis. And we get out p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, and all of the values for the genotypes add up to 1. Now, why is it an equilibrium? Uh, a lot of people think that if you get the values to add up to 1, then it's in equilibrium, but that's not true at all. They should always add up to 1, because we're talking about proportions of a population. Um, all of the individuals in the population should add up to 1. Um, but it's in equilibrium because no matter what value of p exists in the population, there is a corresponding value of big A, big A, the genotype, p squared, that uh, that can be predicted from it. So no matter how the value of P changes, if the population is in Hardy-Weinberg, there's a predictable value for P, or for P squared. If you find that the value does not match what you predict, then the population is out of equilibrium and we're expecting some sort of e evolution. And if there's no evolutionary forces in play at any given, in any given generation, the, the population will come straight back to its equilibrium within one generation. So if, if genotype frequencies change or, or allele frequencies change in a population, then it only takes one generation of random mating that meets all the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg for it to come back to the predicted values for P, P and P squared. So another skill that you'll need to understand in order to work with Hardy-Weinberg in population genetics is to be able to calculate allele frequencies given a number of individuals. So this is fairly easy. You just have to remember that for diploid organisms, we all have 
two alleles for any given locus. So the homozygote is going to contribute two alleles. Uh, every, every homozygote is going to contribute two of the alleles that it's homozygous for. And every heterozygote is going to contribute one allele that it's heterozygous for. And we can look at an example uh, where we're looking at uh, big A, big A with 25 individuals, big A, little a with 50 individuals, and little a, little a with 25 individuals. So the first step is to count the number of individuals in the population. So we have 25 plus 50 plus 25 is equal to 100 individuals. And they each contribute two alleles to the to the population. So the number of alleles is going to be equal to 200. And now we want to calculate P, the proportion of big A in the in the population. So the frequency of big A big A is equal to P is equal to these individuals are going to contribute two big A alleles, so 25 times 2. These individuals are going to contribute one allele each, so they're going to contribute 50 big A alleles. And that's all going to be out of a total of 200 alleles in the population. This works out to 100 over 200, or 0 0.5. Now, P plus Q is equal to 1, therefore Q is equal to 1 minus P. Q is going to be equal to 0 0.5 as well. Now, I want to see if the number of individuals that I observe here in the population is what I expect under Hardy-Weinberg. So now I'm going to calculate the Hardy-Weinberg expected number of individuals. And that's very easy. We just plug in to Hardy-Weinberg. P squared is equal to 0 0.5 squared, or 0 0.25. 2PQ is equal to 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 2 which is equal to 0 0.5, and q squared is equal to 0 0.5 squared, or 0 0.25. Now I multiply that out by the number of individuals, because I want to know the number of individuals in the population that have each of these genotypes. And this is going to come out to 25. This is going to come out to 50. And this is going to come out to 25. And now I can look at my expected number of individuals and my actual number of individuals that have big A, big A, the expected number that have big A, little a, and the actual, and I see that the population is exactly at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. What I predict is exactly what I see in the population. Let's look at another example. In this example, we have 120 individuals with big A, big A, 60 with big A, little a, and uh, 35 ind individuals with little a, little a. So we will have a total of 215 individuals. And that means that the number of alleles, because they each contribute two alleles to the population, is going to be equal to 430. Now I want to calculate P. So 120 individuals will be cal uh, 120 uh, hetero uh, homozygous individuals for big A, big A will contribute two big A alleles each. The heterozygotes will contribute one big A each. And that will be out of a total of 430 alleles. This sums to 300 out of 430. And we get P is equal to 0 0.7. Q is equal to 1 minus P. 
which is equal to 0 0.3. Okay, so now we have our allele frequencies. P is 0 0.7, Q is equal to 0 0.3, and so now we can predict what, under Hardy-Weinberg, what the frequency of genotypes we expect to see in the population. So we can go P squared is equal to 0 0.49, 2PQ is equal to 0 0.7 times 0 0.3 is equal to 0 0.21 times 2 is equal to 0 0.42, Q squared is equal to 0 0.09, now we multiply each of these by the number of pop individuals in the population. And we get 105.4, big A, big A, 90.3, uh, heterozygotes, and 19. 15.4 little a little a. So this is interesting. I have a excess of big A big A homozygotes. I expect to see 105.4 individuals and what I really do see is 120 individuals. I have a, a lack of uh, heterozygotes. I expect to see 90 but I only see 60 and I have an excess of homozygous little a, little a. I have 35 when I ex only expect to see 19.4. So is this population out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Very likely it is, but we still need to apply a statistical test. So, as we just saw, if we have a deviation from the expected number of individuals with each genotype that we expect under Hardy-Weinberg, then that indicates that we're not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and that evolution is happening. So how can you tell for sure whether a population is out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Well first, if you're able to measure allele frequencies across multiple generations, that is clear evidence that uh, allele frequencies are changing. Uh, we don't always have that luxury. Sometimes we want to just be able to look at a single generation. and. Uh, so then it's when you cannot predict the genotype frequencies from the allele frequencies or vice versa. So to test statistically for deviation from a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we apply a chi-square statistical test to test whether the deviation that we observe is significantly different from what you would expect by random chance. And basically we're using count data. So we have chi-squared is, is a statistic that's measured by the sum of all the observed, uh, observed numbers of individuals with each genotype minus the expected number of individuals with each genotype over the expected number of individuals with each genotype summed across all categories of genotypes. So here's an example. We'll use our exact a genotype count that we got from the previous uh, problem. So the easiest way to set, to set up a chi-square calculation is to set up a table. So we have our genotypes and then the observed values and the expected values and then our chi-square calculation So our genotypes are big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. And our observed values are 120, 60, and 35. Our expected values from our previous uh, work are 105. We're just going to round 90 and 20. And then it's very easy to calculate our chi-square value. Our chi-square is 120 minus 105 squared over 105 is equal to 2.14. 60 minus 90 
squared for 90 is equal to right about 10 and 35 minus 20 squared over 35 is equal to 11.25. We sum all of these up, we get 23.39. That's our chi-square st statistic. Now if we compare that to a chi-square table, we find that chi-square for um, for, for one degree of freedom and a p-value of 0 0.05 is 3.841. 23.39 is much greater than 3.841 and so clearly this population is statistically significantly out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so as I was saying earlier, it only takes one generation of random mating to put a population back into Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, that's why we can also think of these values as the expected values. So if we want to ask if with this population that's out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, after one generation of random mating, we would expect to, it to go back to this proportion of genotypes in, in the population if there's random mating. Okay, now let's apply this to a real-world situation. So here we have a disease called phenylketonuria. It's a genetic disease. Phenylketonuria is a pretty nasty metabolic disorder that results um, in shaky limbs, microcephaly, impaired cerebral function, eczema, a whole lot of different uh, symptoms um, because the body cannot break down phenylalanine. Um, and heterozygotes do not express the disease, but are considered to be carriers. So natural selection will only see the homozygous individuals who will not see the heterozygotes because they are fully functional. So if we assume that a population is in Hardy-Weinberg, and we know that the occurrence of homozygous recessive individuals with PKU is one in 10,000 births, how many carriers of this disease that means heterozygotes are in the population. So we want to know how many individuals we expect to be carriers or heterozygotes in the population. And we've got an occurrence of 1 in 10,000 births. So the question is, what value does this represent? This is a genotype, so it's the homozygote for the recessive allele. So that would be, in this case, we could call it little a, little a which is equal to Q squared. Okay, so we know what Q squared is. It's 1 in 10,000, or 0 0.0001. And we want to get just Q, so we just take the square root of Q squared and we get 0 0.01. That's the frequency of little a in the population. Okay, and now we want to get p, so p is equal to 1 minus q, which is equal to 0 0.99. And now we want to know the expected number of heterozygotes in the population. The expected number of heterozygotes is the 2pq part of Hardy-Weinberg. So 2pq was 0 0.01 times 0 0.99 times 2 is equal to 0 0.0198. So about 2% of individuals in the population are carriers of phenylcutinuria. That's what we would expect, at least, under Hardy-Weinberg. And so just a reminder that the Hardy-Weinberg theorem describes a hypothetical population, and there are five conditions for the, to meet the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions. No mutation, random mating, no natural selection, extremely large population size, and no gene flow. So in the real world, most populations do not meet these assumptions. 
And yet the model is still a very useful null model because it allows us to know when evolution is occurring and when it's not occurring. And it's also important to realize that different types of evolution can be going on in different parts of the genome at different times. So some loci might be out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium while others are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So we can look across an entire genome, and if this is an entire genome across eight, uh, ten chromosomes, you'll actually see that there will be some loci out here in the outliers, the red and blue, that are out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and others that are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in, in here in the gray. So it just runs through some quick examples of Hardy-Weinberg deviations. So if we look at a population where the genotype frequencies are varying over time, okay, clearly variation is, is occurring here. So if, if the genotype frequencies are varying, then clearly it is out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, in this case, it's varying in random directions, kind of all over the place in very small amounts. So that seems to be like genetic drift. In here, we would always expect to have some proportion of little a, little a homozygotes. So this is also clearly out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And there seems to be selection against Hardy-Weinberg, uh, uh, seems to be selection against little a, little a homozygotes. Here we seem to have an excess of heterozygotes, which we can just kind of tell. We could also do the test uh, if we wanted to, but if you just look at it, there's way more heterozygotes than you would expect given the other frequencies in the population. So in this case, it seems like there might be selection for heterozygotes. And here we have an excess of little a, little a individuals. Um, again, this might be selection for little a, little a homozygotes. So in summary, a non-evolving population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Evolution occurs when the requirements for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium are not met. And Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is violated when there is genetic drift, migration, mutations, natural selection, and non-random mating. All of 